And so we're gonna go ahead and get ready to get started. So we welcome everybody this morning. We wanna say good morning. Welcome to all those who are viewing by Zoom, uh, whether you're viewing or listening on your phone, uh, any visitors we might have, we welcome you. And glad that you took the opportunity to join us. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up in the word of prayer. Look at Marlene with her smiling face. <laughs> Good morning, good morning. So we're going to open up in a word of prayer. Uh, let's go to the Lord. Lord, we thank you once again for opportunity to meet as the body of believers. We thank you that you woke us up this morning, that you started us on our way. We thank you for your grace and your mercy because it did not have to be that way. And so, Lord, we, we ask that as we go into the session of studying your word as a body of believers, the Holy Spirit, that you would empower us uh, to move according to your will, that you would empower us to teach your word, that it may bring life to our bones. And Lord, have your way as we meet, uh, empower the instructors, that you might get the glory, and that your people might be edified. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and we say amen, amen. So let me send these folks out to their rooms. <clears throat> We will get started. Bless you. Oops, I'm sorry. But thank you. All right, let's. Uh, Everybody's going. All right, y'all. So let me uh, share my screen and we get started. So this is what we're doing this morning, computer. I'm going to act silly on me this morning, y'all. All right, there we go. All right, so this morning's lesson, as we're still talking about the prophets, we're talking about Joshua, the prophet of conquest. And so, as you see, our, lip, our lesson scripture is Joshua 5, 13, then jumping over through, verse, through chapter 6, uh, verse 27. And so our focus scriptures this morning is Joshua 5, 13, uh, 6 through 5, and then 15 through 16, and verse 20. Our key verse, the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have handed Jericho over to you along with its king and soldiers. Joshua 6 and 2, New Revised Standard Version. And so I'll open up and I'll read our text. We'll be using the New Revised Standard Version as we usually do. And so here it is, Joshua 5, verses 13, then chapter 6, verse 5, and 15, 16, and 20. Then, all right, here we go. Once when, Joshua was by, once when Joshua was by Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing before him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went to him and said to him, are you one of us? or are you one of our adversaries? He replied, neither, but a commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face uh, to the earth and worshiped him. And he said to him, what do you command your servant, my Lord? The commander of the army of the Lord said to Joshua, remove the sandals from your feet for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Now Jericho was shut up inside and, and out because of the Israelites. No one came out and no one 
and and no no one came out. Lost my spot. No, nope, I got this. My my computer's acting crazy on me. No one came out and no one came in. The lowest. What's going on my computer? All right, I'm going to get it together. No one came out. No one went in. All right, first, first two. All right. The Lord said to Joshua, see, I have had, I have handed Jericho over to you, along with its king and soldiers. You shall march around the city, all the warriors circling the city once. Thus you shall do for 60 days, I mean six days with seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, the priests blowing the trumpets. When they make a big long blast with the ram's horn, as soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout and the wall of the city will fall down flat and all the people shall charge straight ahead. Verse 15, on the seventh day, they arose early at dawn and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. It was only on that day that they marched around the city seven times. And at the seventh time, when the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. So the people shouted, the trumpets were blown. And as soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpets, they raised a great shout and the wall fell down flat. So the people charged straight ahead into the city and captured this. All right, amen. After my struggle of reading through that one, <laughs> we are there. And so some of the key terms for this week are the Ark. So that refers to the Ark of the Covenant, the box that held the glory, the glory of God. Uh, that they would take around from tabernacle to tabernacle. Uh, the commander of the Lord's armies was the angelic uh, host, angelic force that, that God sent down to, to speak to Joshua. The priests, we know what priests are, and we know about the wall, the, the massive structure that was built around the confined uh, Jericho. And so anybody like to read the introduction this morning? You want the whole thing? Uh, please. Uh, hold on. Because mine, okay. Because mine takes space. To, okay, I'm sorry. Introduction. Our scripture lesson today, Joshua has now entered the role as the successor to Moses. Joshua is a younger, more viral warrior, warrior and prophet. He represents the next generation of leadership. Neighboring kingdoms are, were already aware of Israel's power under Joshua's leadership when they heard that the Jordan River opened up to allow the nations to pass. The nation to pass. The incident val validated Joshua's gift as a prophet. His encounter with an, an angelic being on his way to Jericho resembled Moses' abrupt encounter with God on Mount Sinai. Both prophets would be informed that they must remove their shoes because they stood on holy ground. Not only does Joshua have a youthful advantage, he ensures the, san the sanity of the covenant by having all the men circumcised. Joshua is careful to obey God's instructions. God's presence is evident in every component of his ministry and becomes historic in their ultimate victory over Jericho. The book of Joshua is the culmination of God's promises to his chosen people. It may have been a long time coming, but his promise to Abraham to bring his children to a place flowing with milk and honey would be fulfilled. This event also validates the evolution of Israel into a strong nation, confident in their abilities, confident in their abilities, component in 
military abilities and walking in their divine destiny. All right, thank you. Was that Sister Michelle? Yes. All right, thank you, sis. All right, y'all, as you know, as we do, anytime you need to jump in and comment, just unmute yourself. I can't see you on this end while I'm sharing my screen, but you all know I generally go through and I highlight some things that I see that jump out at me as we go along. And so uh, one of the things I highlighted was that first sentence, um, as you probably see it on your screens, if you can see it, Joshua has now entered the role as a successor to Moses. Joshua is the younger, more viral uh, warrior and prophet. He presents the next generation of leadership. And so this kind of ties into what we discussed last week about having a succession plan of leadership that when God puts us in positions of authority and positions of leader within leadership within his church, that we ain't going to be there forever. That, uh, that, that, you know, we don't, we don't often get to hold the job until we die. And even if we do that, in the meantime, we should be training someone else to come along to step into our place when we transition or we, or we leave that position of leadership. And that's kind of what we talked about a little bit yesterday uh, with the Christian Ed Conference, if you were on. Uh, and so, and so here's my note. Well, yeah. Man, my computer's acting crazy this morning, y'all. All right. So, so I basically uh, recap my note. We won't leave forever. We must recognize the young leaders among us and begin to train and prepare them to one day lead. And so that's what Moses was able to do with Joshua. So Moses trained Joshua to take over when Moses died because he, because he did not receive the promise to get to, the, to, to see the promised land. But God told him that Joshua would. So Joshua is careful to obey God's instruction. God's presence is evident in every, in every component of his ministry and becomes historic in their ultimate victory over Jericho. And so I found this, uh, I found this particular uh, point uh, poignant because we need to understand that obedience is better than sacrifice. We need to make sure that God's presence is called upon for our leadership and our ministry. And that's what it says that Joshua did. Joshua called on the presence of God to be involved in, in the move that he may get ultimate victory. And Joshua was obedient to the things that God told him to do in the, in the way that they walked around the wall and how many times they did it and what they did when they did it. And so, and so, so we also want to ask God that his presence is evident in us to those who we lead and we minister to. And so sometimes uh, I know all of us have been around leaders, ministers, people of faith that were in charge of things and, and, and they led well from a secular perspective but we all, 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 all always did not see that they seemed to have an anointing for what they were doing, as we would call it, or that they had the presence of the Holy Spirit working through them and working in them to help reach those that we're trying to lead and that we want to minister to. Anybody got anything they want to add before I move on to this next? Nope. All right. If you do, just jump in. Uh, the book of Joshua is the culmination of God's promises to his chosen people. It may have been a long time coming, but his promise to Abraham to bring his children to a place flowing with milk and honey would be fulfilled. And so I'm going to tell y'all something. This is a big secret. Y'all don't know this. God is a promise keeper. <laughs> uh, he's a man that he should not lie. If he said it, he will do it. But I want to add this caveat to that particular statement. We need to be clear about the promises that we're waiting on and that we attribute to God. Because oftentimes we will put a promise on God that God hadn't said. But what God speaks to your spirit and you know is God and you can confirm it through the scripture and God made a put a word in your spirit 
and you can confirm with scripture, believe and know that God will keep his promise to you. And he kept his promise to the people, to the children of Israel. And, 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 so, and so here is the combination of the promise as the walls become tumbling down on that seventh day. And so know that God is a promise keeper and he will keep his promise. And sometimes you might have to wait on it. It might be seven days. It might be seven years. It might be seven seconds, seven months. But God will fulfill his promise. And so the last, last couple, all right, telling the Bible story. I'll, I'll read that. In chapter 5, verse 13, we find Joshua approaching Jericho, likely finalizing his military strategy for Israel's is for the Israelite attack. Joshua considers many strategic options. Joshua's trip was interrupted by a vision of a man with a drawn sword. Undoubtedly, Joshua assumes that this is a warrior from the city. Addressing the man, Joshua poses a question, allowing the armed man to identify himself and state his allegiance. The angelic figure responds that he is the commander of God's army and was, and was only on the side of the Lord. His next command to Joshua is to remove his shoes, a sign of humility, and that should be reverence, I believe, and reverence to God, not reference, typo there that they didn't catch, reverence to God. The next chapter unfolds with a multiple... Uh, battle plan unlike anything Joshua had formally discussed. Consider the Bible is led, the battle is led by the priests in the Ark of the Covenant. The story illustrates that the strength of man was not the force that brought down the walls of Jericho. Amen. The primary weapon used against the men of Jericho was the continuous processional and acts of worship, honoring the most high God of Israel. As the priests carried the ark around the city, the story repeatedly states that God is with his people. Anybody glad that God is with his people? God surrounded the city. God is proclaimed the victor. In the end, the battle is not Joshua's or his soldiers. It was the Lord's battle to win. Amen. Amen. In this piece, about how the story illustrates, how the story illustrates um, the strength was not about the men, but it was about the power of God. So we must never forget that obedience to God and praise are powerful weapons. Obedience to God and praise are powerful weapons. We can use to help us achieve victory over our enemies. This is what happens in the story. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not fleshly. They're not man-made. But they are mighty through God, through the spirit of God, for the pulling down of strongholds or for the destroying of strongholds. And so, and so Joshua and them realized that their praise was part of their weaponry. And I want to show a little quick video clip that kind of uh, dramatizes what happened when Joshua uh, called on the people to go around the walls. Here we go.
great is it that we get to tell everybody how Liberty Mutual customizes your car insurance? All right, yeah. So I want to ask the question, what what do you all think about the uh, the statement or assessment I made when I said we must never forget that obedience to God and praise are powerful weapons we can use to help us achieve victory over our enemies? Do, do you all agree with that? Or you think, Reverend, you stretching that a little bit? That's that's church cliche? Or what, what, do, you, what do you think about that? Oh, y'all, can you hear me? Class, can you hear me? <laughs> I, hear you. I hear you, but I was just trying to figure out what to say, I guess. Yeah, this is an open but, forum. Speak your mind, speak your heart. I know. I had an old boss that got on my very last every nerve every single day. And I had to end up praying about it. Like, Lord, um, you know what the deal is. I'm trying to do right. They just want to try to hit me and, and, and hit at any, every little nerve, but I'm not going to let it get to me. And so it ended up that um, we had some kind of fire drill or something. And, but that day that I came in, I had hurt my leg. So, of course, I couldn't walk down the steps. I couldn't run with the other people. And I don't know if it was a drill or something happened, but the fire alarm went off. And the next thing you know, he came in and I was like, look, I can't move and I can't go anywhere. So if it's just a drill anyway, I will hide so that when, you know, the security comes through to make sure we left, I'll just hide over in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> and stay here because it's only a drill and then eventually, you know, nothing will happen. He's like, we can't do that. So he actually went around, found the wheelchair, uh, went to the elevators and everything, wheeled me out, and everybody knew what the that we just couldn't get along. And they were like, wow, Michelle, you can even have your boss, I won't get his name, end up wheeling you <laughs> And, and working with you or for you just to keep you safe. I was like, mm, only God. <laughs> yeah. that, that's, a, that's a great example that, you know, obedience and praise and prayer and, and you, you ask for God to help you with that relationship and with that situation and God came through. It's a, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but a verse in Proverbs that said that when a man is at peace, uh, with peace, peace with God, even his enemies, even he'll be at peace with his enemies, and and so and so so God can switch that stuff around. I think sometimes we don't, we don't, we don't. I think sometimes we receive that type of saying and those type of statements that I made as clicheish, because maybe we tried to pray about something, and we tried to believe God to overcome it through prayer and it didn't seem to work or didn't work how we perceived it. And so we like preaching, you just talking, that's, that's cliche, I did this. But, but I believe our praise is a weapon, that our obedience to God is a weapon. It is it, something that we can use to help get victory in other areas of our life. And so I didn't finish reading that particular session. Let me finish, through common, Though common for readers to view this text from the perspective of physical battle, there are significant references that should be redirected to the spiritual component of this narrative. The presence of the commander of the Lord's army is significant for the future battles that God's chosen people will face. God's presence was ensured by the presence of the ark. The scripture indicates that the battle required more than one angel, but God's army was needed to drive out the spirits of darkness. The narrative illustrates that earthly battles are only shadows for the fiercer wars that are fought, I mean, fought in the spiritual realm. 
And so that's kind of what we alluded to. And one thing, I don't know if you all noticed this on the video, but when the video opens, what do we see Joshua doing? Anybody catch that? I think he was praying. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. He but, he. but he was praying at the Ark of the Covenant. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. So he was kneeled down at the presence of God before he went to the battle. And, and this is free. The Holy Spirit just dropped this on me. But sometimes we go into our battles and we don't approach or address the presence of God before we go. We go in in our own strength. I got this. I'm going to tell them they're going to get a piece of my mind. They're not going to do this to me. And if we pray before the presence of God and God may instruct us to do something, God may instruct us just to be quiet. And God may make them bring you a wheelchair when your leg hurt and you're supposed to come out the room, out the building because it's a fire room, a fire drill, and y'all and y'all generally are oil and water. And so and so we got to remember to address our battles and, and our situations. Everything that we face in life, whether we deem it good or bad, by relying on the presence of God. All right. Anybody want to read St. Kofa for me, please? I'll read it. All right. Which side are you on? It is hard to believe that a song that originated in the coal mines of America would reach the streets of Selma, Alabama. In the early 1930s, when the United Mine Workers of America began to organize around Eastern Kentucky, Florence Reese, a Kentucky miner's daughter and wife, wrote the original lyrics to Which Side Are You On? It remains a labor movement standard. Which Side Are You On? was repurposed during the civil rights movement by tropical, tropical singer, songwriter, Lynn Chander. He recorded this version of the song on the album, W News Story of Selma. Lynn Chandler came to be a tropical singer in Green Ridge Village that moved on to marching with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. from Selma to Montgomery 50 years later. He remains in pursuit of social justice through actions, action and song. There's a new version of the labor standard with side are you on circulating, sung at the Black Lives Matter and the Black Collision Color. Um, coalition action. The song is also used as the intro and outro, outro marching song at some of the Black brunch protests. Malcolm X was a freedom fighter and he taught us how to fight. We go and fight all day and night until we get it right. Which side are you on, my people? Which side are you on? Uh -huh. I'm gonna tell Jarrell, you need to get a solo, Sister Martha. I hate oh you. gosh! <laughs> All right, and so and so here we go. We're tying back to last week when we talked about social justice and the social gospel, and and so we understood that that for those of us who are of age, you know, the civil rights movement was a few years before I was born, and so. I heard somebody say something a couple years ago, and it struck me when they said it. They said anybody born after 1965 that was Black or African American, whatever term you want to identify by, was the first generation to have their full rights. That before that, you know, you dealt with Jim Crow, segregation, and those laws. But after 65, we were the first generation of, of Black folks who were fully vested in America by having their full rights. And that, that struck me. That, I thought that was powerful. That, that's for free. I just threw that one in. All right. And so, and so I want to, uh, in, in this case study, I'm going to read the case study. Walls are more than just brick and mortar. They are systemic practices 
and legislative boundaries that have created boundaries for African Americans throughout the history of the United States. I'm gonna stop there for a second. I, I think that's an important statement. When we look at all that's going on, we think about the death of George Floyd and all the countless other men and women that were uh, killed unjustly, at least that's the way I see it, by police or by vigilantes, Ahmaud uh, Marbury jogging and some you know, folks think they're gonna control their neighborhood because this is my right to do so and, and kill that young man. And we think about the relation to our story in the walls of Jericho. We all heard this in Sunday school as kids. The notion or the thought that we need to re, uh, reimagine what walls mean, reimagine how we see walls, that walls are not just brick and mortar, but sometimes walls are systemic. When we talk about redlining, I'm, I'm pretty sure all of you are familiar, familiar with redlining, where they would literally uh, draw a map with a red line around black neighborhoods and that the banks would not reinvest in those neighborhoods or reinvest in the people who live in those neighborhoods, say if they wanted to get a loan to fix their houses up or a loan to, uh, to do something else in their neighborhood to their homes and the bank would deny them loans, not because their credit was bad, uh, not because they couldn't pay back the loan, not because they did not have a mortgage, but because they were a black neighborhood and they did not want to invest in the black neighborhood just because they were black. Then the neighborhood runs down and then they then they come and regentrify the neighborhood because they drove the prices of the housing down because they wouldn't allow the people to get loans to fix the houses up. And, and so it all becomes a systemic cycle of walls and boundaries and barriers. And, and so we still see this happening in 2021, although the civil rights movement gave us freedom legislatively in 1965. And so a significant impact on tearing down those walls occurred throughout the civil rights movement. Perhaps one of the most recognized events is the March on Washington. The March on Washington was a massive protest march that occurred on August 28, 1963, when some 250,000 people gathered in front of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, DC, also known as the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. The event aimed to draw attention to the continuing challenges and inequities uh, faced by African Americans a century after emancipation. It was also the occasion of Dr. Martin Luther King's junior, now iconic, I Have a Dream speech. And the months after the march on Washington, Ongoing demonstrations and violence continue to, press, to pressure political leaders to act. The following, I mean, following President Kennedy's assassination on November 22, 22, 1963, uh, President Lyndon Johnson broke through, leg, through the legislative stalemate in Congress. The passage of the Civil Rights Act in 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 were turning points in the struggle for civil rights. Together, the two bills outlawed segregated public facilities and prohibited demis, dem, demis, yeah. Oh, why can't you talk this morning? Discriminatory practices in employment and voting. More than 50 years later, African Americans are still fighting for those rights to be held up. The walls of discrimination are constantly creeping up in pockets throughout the country. But it is the responsibility of the people to ensure those walls fall and never allow them to be rebuilt. Never allow them to re be rebuilt. Anybody uh, on on the Zoom this morning? Where any did anybody have an opportunity to actually be at the march on Washington? Yeah, Reverend Williams, I was there. You, you share a quick, I mean, a quick synopsis or a quick uh, 
blurb about what your experience was and what, what you what you felt and saw that day? Well, as you said, there was a lot of people out there. And um, uh, everybody was just uh, really caught up in the atmosphere. Uh, with Martin Luther King uh, giving his famous speech. Um, and, and people from all walks of life, all the nominations. <laughs> and that was just uh, to me uh, awesome yeah, uh, the world from all over the world came to Washington DC that day. And, and just when you look around and, and you can see uh, it, it, it just made you feel uh, very strong this is a good cause and a great cause. And Amen. so I don't know if um, people got to see um, at uh, Metropolitan Amy Church, they came, uh, oh, this is uh, maybe about three, four or five years ago now. Um, they tried, they were trying to uh, get all the people who were there that day to do a uh, presentation. And they, and they interviewed us and, and they taped the service, uh, they taped the interview at, at Metropolitan to be shown later. And, um, and, and this, this was um, uh, presented several times on TBS radio, uh, TV station. So uh, some, some of the family members told me they saw me in it. But yes, I, I really uh, uh, went, and, and I was so happy that I showed up. I almost didn't go, <laughs> because when I was, uh, my manager was telling me so I was working in, and I told him I was going down there, and uh, he said, uh, nothing happened to you, because <laughs> I don't know what, what I did if <laughs> you weren't able to come back. But I say, well, but yeah, to make a long story short, I really enjoyed that. Thank All you. right. Thank you, Brother White, for sharing. And so the, the power of that movement ended up pushing the government of the United States uh, to the Civil Rights Act that eventually gave us full legitimacy, as I said earlier. As, as as American citizens, and and so I, I got a chance to experience the Million Man March, uh, and so that of course that wasn't anything like the March on Washington, but you know that was an iconic time. Um, where we're calling black men to to be more engaged in our in our government, more engaged in our families, more engaged in our churches and our spiritual practices. And so I'm gonna read the uh, life application. We're gonna try to get out of here on time. Uh, here it is. There has never been a time in history uh, there was not some form of conflict between nations or governing groups. Those who lead nations are expected to maintain the balance between protecting the people and achieving peaceful relationships. Unfortunately, this has never been fully achieved. The Bible teaches that there will be differences between nations and conflicts that lead to wars. These are critical times in which the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ must be presented uh, to humanity across the world. The most important battle was won when Jesus Christ rose from the dead. As Christians fight for justice and equality and strive to tear down walls of oppression, Remember, the greatest victory of eternal life has already been won. Has already been won. And so when I read that and I thought about the previous uh, passage that we read and the, talking about the Civil Rights March, um, this, this came to my mind and talking about righteous, uh, righteousness being one and salvation. And so 
I'm going to play a clip and then I'm going to come back to my note. So I'm going to play this small, quick clip. Martin Luther King Jr. said, We will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. From his first sermon at the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama, to his assassination at age 39 in Memphis, Tennessee, Martin Luther King Jr. stood up for truth, for justice, and for righteousness. In August 1963, it's estimated over 250,000 people gathered in the nation's capital for the March on Washington in support of civil rights. King often quoted scripture in his speeches and in his now iconic speech, quoting from Isaiah 40, verses 4 through 5. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed in all flesh, shall we'll see it together. Brought to you by Museum of the Bible. All right. So the reason I played that because when I was reading that, I thought about this particular uh, passage of scripture. And, and it says, um, and Amos was talking on behalf of God. And he said, instead, I want to see a mighty flood of justice and endless rivers of righteousness living. And before that, God, God had Amos tell the people in the previous verses that he was tired of their pretense in hypocrisy. But what he really wanted to see was justice and righteousness. We saw an example of this from the corporations and people spawned out of the Black Lives Matter protests over the killing of George Floyd. These major corporations expressed their support of Black Lives verbally by pledging funds and promising to be more diverse and equitable. But for most of them, it was no more than talk. It wasn't justice or righteousness, it was just talk. And, and, and I say that because if you read the pre, like I said, if you read those previous verses, um, before, before uh, Amos, before he talks about this justice rolling down, like, uh, rich streams of mighty rivers. And he talks about here you are in your panel houses, here you are doing these things, but you're not seeking justice. You're not seeking righteousness. And, and even today in 2021, as I stated in that note, we saw how this eight minutes and 46 seconds change the perception of America. And it just didn't change Black folks, because black folks already knew what was going on. Those of us that are aware or woke, as, as, as us younger generation says, those of us who woke and understand systemic uh, racism, understand police brutality, and, and, and all the other things that we deal with just because of the skin that God allowed us to be born in. But, but this time, it seemed like white folks and other races, not races as racism, but of the ethnic groups uh, understood and saw what was happening in America with that eight minutes and 46 seconds. It literally reverberated around the world. There were protests in all 50 states and several countries. And, and here we saw these businesses, these major corporations make these promises about inequity and inclusion, and we gonna fund this. And the truth of the matter is, almost a year later, it was just talk. Most of them did not come through or, 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 or um, uh, con concretize or not, concretize, not cement their promise by acting. And, 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 um, and so I just think that, that that's important as we look at this lesson, we talk about walls, we talk about what Jer Jericho and Joshua did for the people. Joshua acted on behalf of God. And so, and so I just wanna, uh, while we have a few minutes left, I wanna go through these questions. This is uh, for discussion, y'all, for discussion. Y'all quiet on me today. You quieter, quieter than you were last Sunday. 
but that's okay. We, we're here to learn and discuss. All right. Um, what can the AME church do to adopt programs and practices that intuitively identify gifted, God or God ordained young people like Joshua and mentor them to step into leadership roles. I must admit, I read all these questions and preparing, and I couldn't come up with an immediate answer. <laughs> That's why y'all don't see me with my little highlight in my note. And so I want to know what y'all think. After reading this one now, I got a thought, but I want to hear what you all think about that first question. It's kind of multifaceted. I wrote down a few things. I feel, I feel like um, the AME church has begun to um, identify some things. Like I think by doing like the YPDers and doing some of the leadership classes where they ask people um, who are interested in leadership, I feel like they're, they're beginning to. But one of the things that, um, that I've been thinking about is um, I find that if we don't have a lot of 20 to 40 something people and um, we have a small like teen, but, uh, but we need to do, I think more um, recruitment of, um, I think we, the people that we have, we're gonna try to mold and mentor, but we need to do more recruitment. And what I mean by that is I was thinking more of things on college campuses. I think the college students that we do have mentoring them um, to be able to spread uh, the gospel, but also to be able to help them to become leaders. Because what happens is you, you graduate from college, you get into your career and you kind of, then you get into having, you know, getting married, having kids and you kind of lose focus. And then you kind of try to like, when you have kids, then you try to put them back into the church, but you're still tussling other things. And so one of the things that I was thinking is, um, I think more outreach and like social media, um, more events for um, singles. Like I thought like um, things like um, maybe like basketball teams or sports teams or things that families could attend. Yeah, we, yeah, we do like our Easter egg hunts and different things like that, but other ways to kind of tie people in, bring people in. Um, that's what I was thinking. Um, but like I said, I think the YPDers are a good start and I think the leadership classes are, um, but I think what's hard is sometimes people may not see themselves as a leader or they may not um, as a possible leader. You know, sometimes people think, well, I've got to have all these degrees or I've got to have all this knowledge, but sometimes it's just confidence. Uh, sometimes it's mentoring. Sometimes it's building people up to get them there. And somebody seeing something within a person to say you're gifted and you need to hone in on this. So I just think, like I said, figuring out ways to um, continue to mentor and to guide people and you know outside people also into the church oh great great answer great answer uh so, williams go ahead um i think too this is lead up to a lot that was discussed at least in our class for the christian education conference yesterday absolutely about um education programs and classes you know must be designed so that um so show clearly and show excitement for the word of God, because that's what you got to start with. And so it's like, you know, you got to change the way we do like our Bible study class or something. And it was, it was a lot said yesterday. And I was like, oh, wow, <laughs> that, you know, and I guess that like, um, I agree um, that, it's a lot that the AME is trying to do because yesterday too, I listened to the Bishop had some of the, um, for the black colleges and he had some of the students on 
and one of our students was on there, um, D. Anthony, and um, asking them what can happen, you know, if they're where at school, the AME can do to help. And one of the things was that need to notify, let, you know, they need to communicate with, um, I guess, college campus, like, I guess our church, we probably need to just send out stuff to Howard and let them know we are here or if you need us, you know, whenever, I guess whenever they have the freshman orientation, it's just, something need to be worked out for them so that they can be, get involved. It's cause you, you got to keep them involved in the AME church. If they was a member of AME church and go away to college, they will always be if you, you know, continue to try to attract them. Great, great. And, and, and I agree, and I, I, I like what you all are saying. Um, one of the things that I, I'm keenly aware of uh, coming out of where I, come, I came from before God led me to join here and, and, and be involved in this ministry and kingdom work is that I saw firsthand how ministering and identifying youth and young people leads to the growth of your church. I remember when we started uh, having church in Blair, Montgomery Blair High School, there were several times that persons wanted to join the church even while we were in the high school, but they were reluctant because they asked me, they said, do you all have anywhere or anything for my children? And at that time, we had not developed any type of youth ministry or children's ministry. And I had to say no. And their response back to me was, I would really like to join here. I like the preacher. I like the, the, the music. But I need to have something for my children. If you had something for my children, I would join today. And so... Like I said, I heard that on multiple occasions. So that speaks to us who are in leadership, one, having programs and practices in place that, that will, one, draw them in and have something for them to do, for something to go to, and then being able to identify those who are gifted, those who, who've been God-ordained. God um, and because of the structural uh, setup of our church, well, I'm, sometimes I'm trying not to say what I need to say because I don't want to offend nobody, but, <laughs> but I'm going to be me and just say, sometimes we get caught up in this hierarchy and the structure and it limits our ability to be creative. Well, you know, we can't do that because that doesn't correspond with the discipline. But this is what we need to help meet people where they are. This is what we need to do to possibly help expand our ministry and expand the kingdom of God. And we get restricted by rules and regulations. And, and, and some of us who are in leadership that are seasoned, as we talked about in the lesson, we're not looking for somebody to pass the torch to. We're going to keep the torch until we die and it go out. <laughs> mm. We ain't trying to so pass it, it to nobody or even mm. like anybody else's torch. Mm. <laughs> and that's something, uh, I, like I told you, I listen to Joe Madison every morning on Sirius XM. And that's one thing he says. I kind of agree, disagree, but he says, you know, people tell him, Joe, you're older now. You need to be passing on the torch. And he said, I'm not passing on my torch. He said, I light somebody else's torch. He says, because when I pass on my torch, that puts me in the dark. He says, but as long as I got the torch, I can, lead, I can light the way and lead the way and then light somebody else's torch and we can lead the way together and light the way together. And, and so, so we need to understand the succession of leadership. All right, what are some critical, what are the critical areas in your community that require new leadership? Um, hmm. For me, so I, live, I live in Bowie and I, you know, that's my community, Prince George's County. Uh, for me, I, I think 
Well, we got some new leadership in there. I was going to say schools. I like <laughs> Dr. Golson is doing doing so far with schools. Uh, we definitely need some new leadership in the law enforcement area, and uh, mm -hmm. our wonderful county executive, Sister Also Brooke, is working on that as they're they are paneling and trying to, you know, fire, find who the new chief of police will be for Prince George's County. That we might have some reforms on how they police us. Uh, that maybe the person who runs the police will look like us, who are the majority that live in the county. Mm -hmm. So when people look like you and I can identify with you, they seem to have a different perspective of how they treat you. As folks who don't live in the county, who don't live look like us, and who've been conditioned to see us in a, a particular way. So when we interact with them through law enforcement, y'all know the rest of the story. Anybody got anything I want to add? I feel like I'm talking a lot. I was thinking I live in DC and um, there's such a divide because of so much of the gentrification um, that I think, um, I think, you know, everything that happened last year um, I think helping everyone, I don't want to say to melt because I don't think we are you know, we always say a melting pot. I don't think it, I think it's tolerance. I think it's, um, helping, you know, uh, non-black or brown people to, um, understand us and see where, where we're at. But I think it's also, um, Black, black and brown people to understand. I mean, because I think you've got some resentment um, with, you know, the city changing so quickly the way that it is, and us not having had had the services and the restaurants and the buildings and education that the city, you know, maybe deserved. But now we see it happening now. So I think there's a lot of um, resentment sometimes amongst us who've been here um but i think like i said i don't want to say i don't want to say melting uh pot but i just think tolerance acceptance um and you know helping us to be able to grow together um and then i think also i mean even though we have a lot of churches um a lot of big churches in the in the city I think um, more development of the youth within the city. All right. Anybody else got anything you want to add to that particular question? We can, or we can move to the last one and get ready to get out of here. I'm gonna make it quick, real quick, because everybody said everything that I wanted to say too. But from the class, yeah, we can teach them and train them and everything else, but we have to make sure that we you know, we can attract them and bring them in, but we also have to get them to the point where they actually want to come back to us. You know, once they get out there, um, you know, and they get to the other churches or they go to another friend's place or something, and then they come back and even to visit our own church, it's like, mm, this is this doesn't have the jump and the pump and everything else that the other places have. So then the next thing you know, they're gone because we had a lot of kids within that 25 to 40 range that just left because we didn't retain and we didn't keep because we want to keep stuff to ourselves instead of letting it go out to them. As you said, passing the torch or at least letting them be a part of the torch or the fire. <clears throat> they're gone. So... Now, with the little ones that we have, when we attract them only because their parents are making them come, we have to find a way to keep them. And even when they go out, that they come back. Yes. That's true. Yeah. Something that you said that I, that I process, you might not have said this intently, or, but this is the way I process it. Uh-oh. What did I say? That we... Not only do we need to attract them and train them, but we got to give them access. Mm -hmm. so, so, so it's nothing. I mean, it doesn't help us to attract them and train them, and then we don't let them work. Right. 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 Exactly. 
No, y'all go over there. We got it. No, it's it's true. I mean, I'll be honest with you. We joined and then we started, <laughs> we visited some other AMEs, and um, you know, I kind of wanted to go somewhere else, and my husband said, "No, we're going to stay, and we're going to do this." You know, um, because I had people like invite me to read Temple and Metropolitan and other different places when we when we were looking, um, and they had different things going on. And so I, I, I get it. I do get it. Yeah, yeah. And so we got to get them access. We got to let them touch that equipment up in the balcony, help run the cameras and, and work the sound and, and do, you know, do those other things that we often like, no, no, don't touch that. Don't, don't get on that. No, leave that alone. And so we got to get them access. All right. Last thing we're going to. Well, you no, know, I don't know if we got enough time for the last question. We kind of touched on that, or oh, Sister uh, Angelita uh, touched on that when she talked about the gentrification and how and how our communities, especially in D.C., it was a big a big issue. How how people who've been there 30, 40 years in these communities, and the property values have driven up, and now these are retirees, Social Security uh, recipients. Now they can't pay their taxes on their homes and they're being pushed out of the communities. And so they put the bike lanes and dog parks in, and the next thing you know, the, you know, what was, was chocolate sauce is now vanilla, you know, vanilla sauce. So. Yep. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh. and, and, you know, and, and the people who built that community and established that community no longer can live in that community. And so, all right, I'm gonna leave it there. I, I don't wanna say a whole lot, but. <laughs> All right, um, I'm gonna go ahead and do the closing prayer. It's kind of hard for us to kind of do it together all on audio because we're not in sync. So if you want to mute yourself and pray along with me or pray along with us, and uh, we can do that. And so let's go ahead and have a closing prayer. Lord of heaven and earth, almighty and all wise God. We long for your presence as we get to the battles that confront us. Strengthen our faith, Lord Jesus, to believe that the same power that parted the Red Sea and brought down the walls of Jericho will rest in us as we face the adversities of life. May our mouths be filled with praise, like the Levites who walked around Jericho's walls. May we be united as your army to face every battle with victorious heart. May our faith in Jesus Christ be our ark of safety to carry us through every battle in life. We lift this in his master's name. Amen. Amen. So we thank you all for Amen. joining us one more time. I'm going to bring the babies back. And we got like 60 seconds if y'all want to hang on. If not, you can go ahead and uh log. I just had a, a quick thing real quick because um and then I know I don't understand why I'm talking. But um <laughs> just like this voting, we had the votes, they said too many of us voted, and now they're gonna try to have a bunch of bills from Alaska down to Florida where they're coming to suppress anybody's votes. So Absolutely. they're still trying to bring us down. And and I don't know how we're gonna fix this, you know. Uh, unfortunately, what it calls for us to do is outperform the system. And so that's what happened in Georgia for the last election. They had some stuff in place, but we overwhelmed the system. And and so for us, and that's why they're trying to we change understand. the law down there. Yeah, and so we, I, for those of us who are politically aware, like it seems that you are, we understand what they're trying to do with the system and the laws to suppress a specific uh, demographic of vote. And within that demographic, they know generally the majority of that demographic is black people. And they know that black people generally vote generally in one direction over for one side. And so um, that one is incumbent upon us who are legal uh, voters, legal age to vote, legally registered, and are legally allowed to vote, 
to exercise our franchise. It is important because obviously it's important because they're trying to block you from doing it. Mm -hmm. Ain't nobody trying to break in my house and still not, they don't see this valuable. Mm -hmm. Well, we got to get these young adults <laughs> involved to thinking to let them know how important their vote is to keep us going. Well, yeah, that's when it's come to we we need to have, you know, they need to be trained. And then plus, this need to be explained to what's happening. Because some people don't understand what is happening. So that's another thing for training. 